Well, good morning, church. I'm excited. We have double digit temperatures outside. Some of the streets are actually clear of snow because it melted with that beautiful sunshine we had yesterday. But we are getting prepared for a few more inches. It is winter in Iowa. It'll be beautiful, I'm sure. But uh, got a lot of things coming up. A lot of things going on with this church that is really, really, literally on the move. Um, this, uh, today we start our Overcomer uh, Sermon Series. And then Wednesday night, we're going to start a Bible study, the Overcomer Bible study that will take us deeper into uh, what Pastor Mark is going to be uh, bringing us today about overcoming falsehood with faith. So we're looking forward to that. Now, we will be praying for Pastor Mark because he is, what is it, a 19-hour drive, Park? He's driving 19 hours out towards the East Coast for work as soon as church is over today, and then he'll be back next weekend and be praying for safe travel for him on that. Um, but the whole church on the move thing, well, literally, um, we have been very thankful for uh, Huss Church for allowing us to be here over the last year uh, through the pandemic and everything else that's going on. Um, they have been gracious hosts. But as of March 1st, we will be taking possession of our new space at 310 3rd Street Southeast here in Cedar Rapids. Uh, if you're not familiar with that area, or if you are and you know, that's the Arco building. So uh, we'll be posting up uh, directions to that on our website, on our social media, so you can find your way there uh, after the beginning of March. Now we're going to start that off running. We'll have our third Bible study, Overcomer Bible study, there on the first Wednesday of March. And then on Saturday night, we'll have our movie, uh, over the uh, War Room movie. And uh, that'll be at 6 o'clock with the doors opening at 5.30. Concessions, uh, Mark tells me, we've got to go out and buy more brownie bites and lemon bites and such. But uh, we're going to have a lot of great stuff uh, there. And uh, we'll be posting up the link to the trailer uh, later today in the, on our website and on our Facebook page. So you can go out and watch that and just kind of get a feel for what the movie is about. But if you've seen it, wonderful movie. If you haven't, you got to come and watch it. Um, and it's free. No, uh, so come join us for that. And then the following day, that's the exciting, that's even more exciting because we well, already had two things in the building, but the following day, we will have our very first worship service there. So pretty excited for that. We've got some plans for uh, this coming week to start getting things moved in. The painters have been there and painted the walls um, early this coming week. Uh, the carpets will be cleaned and uh, they're going to put down a, some scotch guard on it so that's good. we're uh, pretty good at drinking our coffee and a uh, few of us i'll just raise my hand are good at spilling coffee without a lid so i gotta be careful um, but i think the scotch guard is for me but other than that um, we've got some great things coming up and then the following weekend we have our next orange track and we'll have our very first orange track there so it just keep, the ball keeps rolling and, and we're very excited about that so uh, please join us. Please keep your eye on our website, on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. We'll be having that out there as well uh, so you can see where we're at and what we're doing. But now we get to, let's get to the heart of why we're here and worshiping God. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 56, verses 1 through 4. And the psalmist writes this, it says, he says, Be gracious to me, O God, for... Man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God's I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? This is a psalm. This is David. This is this is he's he's he knows he's in constant danger. He's, uh, so, whether it's Saul, the Philistines, or other enemies, and he really knew that he couldn't count on himself or anyone else, but he knew he could count on God to rescue him. And and these first four verses, there's no fluff here. David gets right to the point. He just pours out his heart to God. And in doing that, he appeals 
to God's mercy, knowing that even though he's not worthy, God would be there for him. And any fear that God ha- or that David had, he replaced with the knowledge that no matter what happened, God was right there. And there's so many times in our lives when things are happening and, and we f- we're human, we tend to forget to go to God. But if we go to God, he is there and ready for us. He is ready to take us through it. And that's a trust that will propel us to a greater faith, a deepening of our relationship with God. And, and you know, as, as I was reading this psalm and, and I was thinking about some of the things that it was saying, at the very end he says, what can man do to me? And Paul takes that a little further in Romans 8.31 where he says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, Who can be against us? Gracious and loving Father, as we prepare to hear your message this morning, Father, as we prepare to hear the words that you have given to Pastor Mark, we thank you. Number one, we thank you that you have given him the teaching for us this morning. We thank you that your word brings our relationship with you alive, that love with you alive. Father, help us to hear your words this morning as we understand that it is only by faith that we are saved, that it is overcoming this falsehood that is out there, doing it through faith and a deeper relationship with you, Father. We pray a blessing on Pastor Mark this morning as he brings this message. And we ask that you would prepare us right now to hear your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Terry. We got uh, some really exciting things going on here. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to all of the possibilities and opportunities that God is putting into us and into us as a church to be able to impact our community. And so, you know, when we talk about a church on the move, it's more than we're just physically moving locations, but it's enabling us to do more as a church and to outreach and to be God's hands and feet and to actually get out there and do something, uh, which is what we're supposed to be doing to begin with. So, you know, being obedient to God. And uh, today we start on a a really neat series by Dr. David Jeremiah, and it's called Overcoming and the Overcomer series in here. And so it has a number, uh, he's got two different studies. He's got one that is a six week session. He's got another one that's a 10 week session. I have both of them at home. So, you know, I'm good kind of bouncing back and forth and going through some of these things. But today we're overcoming falsehood with truth. And so I kind of want you to get a mindset on this from the very onset this morning. A falsehood stems from a lack of truth, which leads to fear. So falsehood stems from a lack of truth, which leads to fear. And faith, on the opposite end of the spectrum here, faith is the belief and trust in and loyalty to God and his truth that is found in the word. So when we take a look at those, they're kind of diametrically opposed to each other. So that neither the two shall cross or or occupy that same place at the same time. You know, I come from a physics background, so I I tend to look at things from that kind of physical perspective and and taking a look at things. And so um, the falsehood stems from a lack of truth, which leads to fear. And faith is the belief and trust and loyalty to God and his truth that's found in the word. So I want that to really sink in. That's why I'm repeating these all over. But the major point I wanted to talk about that ties these together is that fear is an illusion. And fear being an illusion 
is something that we really, really need to understand because a lot of times our humanness allows fear to overcome common sense. It overcomes our faith at times because fear and faith cannot occupy the same place at the same time. It is like light and dark. You can't have light and dark in the same place at the same time. There has to be something to block the light in order to have that darkness. And so that's why I want you to understand that faith overcomes those falsehoods, that truth and loyalty in God and in his word overcomes those falsehoods. Those falsehoods lead to fear. So fear is an illusion. So years ago, we had a haunted corn maze that we used to go out and work all the time. And I, I was the chairman of that. So, you know, we had a lot of fun going out there and it was a fundraiser. And our funds that we had, we raised funds and that went to the uh, Shriners Children's Hospitals. And so it helped fund out the Shriners Children's Hospitals. And by the end of the season, we used to be able to get a check for about 24000 to $25,000 that we could help fund this. Because anybody that knows anything about the Shriners Hospitals are, the kids go and get treated absolutely free. All of the devices, all of the procedures, all the surgeries are free. So we held a haunted corn maze out there and people flocked from all over the place to experience the maze, to get frightened on purpose. So he had people that would drive in, I mean, literally hundreds of miles away to come and experience this and to get frightened out there in the middle of a dark cornfield. And I want to tell you, it was dark. And when the wind rustled through that corn, just without anybody popping out and scaring you at that point in time, it kind of got the mood set really, really well, I got to tell you. And so it was that mystique of wandering around in the dark, waiting for the unknown. Then when they encountered something, they would scream out in fear. Now understand, they went into that maze knowing that it was going to be out there. And they knew that it wasn't real. And they were paying to get scared. But they succumbed anyway. They succumb to fear anyway. And that's what's called a primal reaction. It's, it's something that's kind of built into our, into our uh, physical being and our mental being. So they would scream and they would run and, and uh, you know, at times they'd get chased a little bit for a little distance in the dark, in the middle of a cornfield. So understand, uh, that kind of illusion that we have, that illusion of fear is created and it is something that we have control over. See, we know it's not real and we know it's not true and we know it's not the real world. So I want you to kind of understand that and then mold those concepts over in there. So people were coming from all over to experience this, to get frightened on purpose, and they paid us for it. How much better can it be than that? But they had to understand at the same point in time that it wasn't real. And they knew that it was out there. So they knew that something was coming that they were going to have to face and they were going to have to face fear head on. But see, the real world that we live in is very, very different from that. We don't know what's out there. It is real. And it is that fear of the unknown, not knowing what lies ahead, that can be very frightening, even when we know that something is probably out there. We just don't know what, but it is real. And so we think about this and we know something that's false when we start going through that maze. And we know that, hey, we have some truth that we're gonna have to face out here in the real world. And it becomes very hard to discern the truth from falsehoods. Because we 
undertake a learned experience at that point in time. And see, things may seem real, but they're not. And if we don't spend the time to study and find out about what is real and what is false that we face, then we are truly what I would term ignorant. And by that I mean that we're lacking that knowledge, the information and awareness about a particular thing or subject that we face or even that kind of a situation. So basically we're uninformed to what really lies ahead. And see, it's been shown time and time again that ignorance breeds fear. Ignorance breeds fear, that unknowing, that lack of knowledge, that lack of information. So if we don't study, we're gonna be subject to that lack of knowledge, that lack of information on what actually lies ahead. So ignorance breeds fear and unbelief breeds fear. So I started this off by talking about how falsehoods were the lack of the truth. And those lack of truths lead to fear. So if we are uninformed and we're looking at falsehoods that have that lack of truth and lead to fear, then we're kind of setting ourselves up for that type of failure, for that kind of fear to, to take over that portion of our lives. And see, fear only has power in your life if you give it power. Fear only has power in your life if you give it the power to rule over you. See, and that's where truth comes into play. Fear and falsehood go hand in hand. Falsehood is that lack of truth. And physiologically, it makes our body weaker. It makes our body weaker. But truth, on the other hand, truth, as you see in the Word of God, truth is always talked about giving us that strength. It makes us stronger. And physiologically, it does make us stronger. It emboldens us to go forth and do things. That truth that we have behind us will take us to new levels, gives us the strength to face our fears. So when we take a look at these things, we have to understand that physiologically this has some of these effects on our bodies. And so if we live in a constant state of fear, it weakens us physically. Whereas if we live in the truth and we live according to the light, then it strengthens us and it makes us healthy, both mentally and physically. And this is primarily detected in the muscles of the body and their response to given stimuli of what we refer to as positive and negative stimulus. We tend to be reactive when it comes to fear and so in that corn maze, when encountering something frightening, even though you know it's there, and even though you know it's not real, you run and scream. See, we have that, that control in there, in our body, and it's a fight or flight reaction. And that becomes from a learned response from the time that we were very small children. And it's innate in our very being to have that fight or flight response. We have a choice to make. Either we can stand and fight or we have to run in fear. We have a choice. And so the most prevalent command that we find in the Bible today, if we take a look at it, God's word itself, is the term fear not. And see that term fear not, don't have fear, and it's termed different ways in the Bible. But that term fear not in the Bible is in there over 220 times. 220 times. So if you think of this as God's word, you think God really, really wants to emphasize the fact that we are not supposed to base our lives 
in fear. That lack of knowledge, that lack of unknowing, that lack of awareness to a particular thing, a situation, or a subject. He wants us to get into the word and study his word because his word is the truth. And we know that the truth overcomes fear. It overcomes those falsehoods. It gives us that basis of knowledge to know what's good and what's evil and how to overcome it. So I have a question for you this morning. Do you know who and what you trust in. Who do you put your trust in? And what do you put your trust in? And see, for those who are faithless out there, and I'll use the term we, when we are faithless, we have no trust. And then you're kind of going, well, wait a minute, Pastor Mark. How's that work? Well, see, if they had faith in something, then they would trust that to be real. But you have no faith, then you don't know. And you face fear. It's that lack of knowledge. And if we're faithless and we have no trust, then we are uncertain of who we are and where we are going. And then we get that whole facing the great unknown again. And it builds that fear even worse. And it leads to worry. And worry never adds a day to your life. Check it out, it's in the scripture. We need to trust in God and have faith in the truth of his word. And if we study his word and if we get into it and have that knowledge, the information, the awareness of those things, that truth that's in God's word, See, then we don't have a place for fear. It has no place. Because they can't occupy the same place at the same time. Psalms 37, 1 through 9 says, Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of his heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him and he will do this. Now notice what it said there. It doesn't say he might do this or he may do this and if he feels good on this day, he'll do this. The word of God says that commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Now, what does that tell you? It dispels the darkness. It dispels the falsehoods. Remember? Darkness and light can't occupy the same place at the same time. So God says, if you commit to me, he will make a righteous reward like the dawn, the brightness that dispels the dark of night. Like your vindication is going to be like the noonday sun. Very bright. No place for that darkness to exist. The truth of God. But it also says to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret because it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will inherit the land. And so when I think about this passage in here, you know, it gives us that opportunity to build us up, but it's that reassurance. Don't base your life on worry. Don't base your life on the negative things of this world, the darkness that exists in the world. Don't keep going back to those dark things. But trust in God. Put your faith in God. Walk with God daily and he will make that brightness like the dawn. 
He will make a vindication like the noonday sun. All of those fears will be dispelled. How many people have sheer fear and terror in the middle of the day at noon? Not too many. Who's afraid to walk into a dark basement, a dark room, or walk down the sidewalk at night? So that darkness builds fear within us. And the light of God shining in our path, in our way, and shining from within us when we have the Lord in our heart dispels that fear. So be still in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't rush in and be scared. Wait patiently for the Lord. He will walk you through. There's a verse in the 23rd Psalm that said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. See, that passage tells us something right there. It says, we're not stuck in that valley of the shadow of darkness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of darkness. But what else does it tell us? That God is with us. He's with us through the darkness and he will bring us through the darkness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for the Lord art with me. His rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So when we take a look at that, we have those assurances of God, but unless we study the word of God and know the truth that's found in his word, we're stuck in that land of darkness. We're stuck in that valley of the shadow of death. And through his son Jesus, he brought us out of all of that. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to live within us. So that with that light of the Spirit of God, that Spirit of holiness living within us, we don't have to fear. Because he's already there and he's bringing us through it. We don't have to run in fear. We don't have to go and hide. We don't have to worry about that next procedure. We don't have to worry about those things because God is there with us and he will bring us through it. So we've talked about many times about false teachers and false narratives and how many are fooled by the seemingly genuine people that are out there. And those people can quote scriptures and they can claim to be genuine but are really wolves in sheep's clothing. And I think about that at times because, see, if you look at the Word of God, it tells us that even the demons know the Scriptures and they tremble in fear at the presence of God. He'll bring those people out of the darkness. Even the demons know the Scriptures. So it's difficult at times to see through the guises, sometimes called disguises, because it, the dis in there, the negativity in there, it says, I am going to cloak myself from you. I'm going to be disguised so you can't recognize me for who I am. So sometimes those guises that we face at times in the people really get to the heart of the person. But in all things, given time, will be able to see through it and they will be revealed for who they really are. And we're called to shine the light of truth on them through the power of God's word. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will inherit the land. And Psalm 37 goes on, it continues and gives us more guidance on this in, in verse 30 and in verse 40. And in verse 30 it says, The mouths of the righteous utter wisdom and their tongues speak what is just. And verse 40 kind of wraps it up for it. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. 
they take refuge in him. But see, we can't do any of that. We can't take refuge in God unless we know God, unless we have that right relationship with him, that righteousness, because that's what righteousness means. It means having a right relationship with God, a true and just relationship. And remember what I told you about uh, when we very first started, we talked about trust and we talked about truth and having that loyalty to God as being an integral part of that. See, that loyalty to God is that right relationship, that righteousness that we have with God. And if we truly don't know the word of God, how can we ever know what's real and what's true from what's not? How do we know what the falsehoods are unless we know what the truth is first? We won't be able to see it. See, and that's why we here, we're a Bible-based ministry, meaning we back up what we preach and what we teach with the Word of God, with the truth of God. And we allow that truth of God to be revealed in each and every one of us as we study his word, as we study that truth. And that's what it's really about. If we're, if we're truly lost in the world, then we tend to lean, lean on those worldly things to guide us along instead of the truth of God. But when we allow the spirit of holiness to control our lives, we'll not only speak the truth as we talk, but we will live it. We will live it out for the world to see. As we let our light of Christ shine from us and dispel that darkness from around them, we can help lift the people out of their darkness as well at the same time. That's what being the hands and feet of God is all about. God calls each one of us to be a minister. And he calls us to minister to each other in our time of need. And see, that's called edification. That's called lifting them up and building them up in the word of God, in the truth, to dispel fear, to dispel worry, to dispel those guises that keep us and separate us from the truth of God. So we will represent Christ to others as we have that spirit of holiness living within us, as we allow that truth to be spoken from us. First Timothy 6, 17 and 19 says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. And there's other translations that say, all that we need for a fulfilled life. Fulfilled life. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. So when we got together and we founded Prayer Care Share Ministries, which is the uh, overarching umbrella for Orange Track Racing, for Grace Street Church, and for our outreach ministries that we do, the movie ministries and things. So we, we named it Prayer Care Share Ministries, and we did it very, very purposefully. It is foundationally who we are and what we do, and it is our statement of our responsibility to the community. We need to pray and we need to pray and care for these people and share with them the hands and feet of God. Putting our faith in action to serve others, not ourselves. It's not to build ourselves up at all but it is to pray, care, and share for others. 
And see, Grace Street Church is named very specifically and very purposefully as well, is we want to be that avenue. We, we talked about the highway to hell and how wide and, and easy it was to go on that. Well, we want Grace Street Church to be that street that people can go on to find the truth of God, to find that salvation, to find that right relationship. And we want to make that as easy as possible through all the things that we do. It's that path of truthfulness that we need to follow. So it's not only who we are, but it is what we do. So one of our studies that we're going to have after Easter this year is the Truth Project from Focus on the Family. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because it is an absolutely awesome way to know. And remember what I said, we need to study the word. We need to look at it. We need to look at it from different angles and different sides. So we get preaching and teaching. We have our Bible studies. We have our outreach through our prayer ministry that we do, through the movies that we show. To give people different avenues, different streets to come into a relationship with God. And the truth project that we're going to have is one of those avenues. See, and it gives, it gives us uh, a way that is very designed to have uh, revelations about a biblical worldview and why it's important to us in our daily walk. And it tells us the power of knowing the truth and how the, the truth can actually change our lives through prayer and study. And building on it, it will give us that difference and being able to know the difference between that worldview and a biblical worldview. From the truth of the world and into the truth of knowing God's truth. And knowing the difference, the truth from the worldview to God's view from that biblical worldview is enough to guide us through each and every day of our lives, to keep us on that straight path, on the correct path, and away from fear and falsehoods. So it's an awesome study and experience, and I would ask you to make a point to bring someone with you, especially if they're skeptical, <laughs> if they're skeptics, or if they are faithless. So they can hear and know the truth. It may not change their mind, but then again, it may change their mind and their life as well. As we look into God's word this morning, there's a fascinating story in the Gospel of Mark. And we find it in chapter 9, verse 14. And a man brings his demon-possessed son to Jesus' disciples to be healed. But see, the disciples cannot drive the demon out. So the father goes to Jesus and he asks his son to he be healed. And in turn, Jesus casts the demon out. And that young boy is restored. A short while later, the disciples come to Jesus and, and, and they're confused and they're, they're just kind of in disarray. And, and, and they come to him in private and ask, well, why couldn't we cast this demon out? To which Jesus replied, these only come out through prayer, through prayer. This story gives us a glimpse into the power that lies, that the lives of the world and the lives of man and of the devil have in the lives of those around us. So powerful in many cases that only the faithful, persistent prayer of a believer can break that stronghold. Praying for, caring of, and sharing the truth of Christ for those in need and for us personally keeps us in tune with God. Through study and community with other believers, that unity that we've been talking about for the last year. See, that, uh, that community with the other believers, along with our study, and our growth and our truth. When we have all those things in place, 
we're going to experience, if you haven't already, that God's power come to you as your relationship strengthens with the Lord and with our church. See, God will reveal more of himself and more of his plan for our lives as that right relationship, that righteousness builds within us as we study his word and come into community with believers. And as a result, your prayers and petitions are vital to the work that God wants to do in transforming their lives. And we've seen this in our midst in answered prayers and lost coming home to God. And I don't mean just once, but we see it continuously through our prayer ministry. We see these prayers answered. We see people coming back to God and restoring relationships restoring lives and they were cast out of that existence they had through prayer through care and through sharing in our call to worship this morning we heard psalms 56 1 through 4 and here is david and he's crying out be gracious to me O god for man tramples on me all day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. And when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now these words, you know, if we look on our very money, we, the, the founding fathers of the United States wanted this to be an example that the people would understand. This, this word in here, in God I trust, is on every piece of coin of money that we have. See, we're supposed to put our trust in God, not in the money. Most people lose faith track of that, that these are actually the things that the Founding Fathers wanted us to do. He wanted us to follow the scriptures. They wanted us to know that money wasn't the answer, and the only answer was to put trust in God. In this, the psalmist David speaks to the plight of his life as Saul and his men were chasing him and wanted to put him to death. But it's also a testament to us of how we can look to God when the pressures of the world are coming to play in our life. How we can trust in God and trust in the truth and in the promises of his word. And I just want you to think how many times we felt chased by the world, trampled, trampled beaten down and attacked. Where do we turn? We go to that fight or flight response. What do you choose? Who do you choose? Do you choose the world or do you choose and put your trust in God? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He's bringing us through the dark times in our lives. Put our trust in God first. And to be quite honest, I think once you do that, you can start to build that behavior pattern. And you know what? Once we do that, those fears aren't there. We don't face the same trials in the same way ever again because we know that God is there and he's bringing us through the trials. Bringing us through the trials. He's there with us the whole time. See, for too many of us, we look only at the darkness of our immediate circumstance and focus on the negative. And as we've learned in many, many messages here, that negative attracts negativity, and so we become trapped at our own self-made prison. And I talked about that in, a, in our sermon here a couple of weeks ago. 
And I asked you that point, and I gave you homework. I said, who's the lifeline that we call when this happens? Do we, like David, put a call into the Lord, into his saving grace? Or do we look to the world and become lost in the wilderness? So I wrote this back in 2015, but I feel it needs to be restated today. And I posted this up in Facebook again this week. It goes like this. When everything seems to be going against you, remember an aircraft takes off into the wind in order to soar to greater heights. You have to believe to achieve. Our perceptions control our beliefs and ultimately our beliefs control our actions. See, so we don't blame others when you're not heading in the right direction in your life. You made the decision to go that route. Learn to trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit. Venture into the light. Because when we are in God's power, what can man do to us? Nothing at all. The choice is yours. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for this opportunity to gather here today to explore your word, to explore the truth that you reveal to us each and every day, to be one in community with you today, with each other, lifting each other up, edifying us in the word of God, showing us the way out of the darkness, showing us how we can overcome the falsehoods of the world with your truth, the truth. As you said in the scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us that path to you, for telling us what the truth is, to tell us how to live our lives in you and through you. And in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Too many things scare us. As we prepare to look for a new home for Gray Street. The unknown of that was a little daunting and, and it did cause some fear. But God was in and of it all. And as we looked and looked and looked, God guided that. Even when we thought we had found the perfect place, God was still guiding us where we needed to be. And he does that when we're afraid. And and. You know, Mark talk, had many scriptures today, but the one that just sticks is in, in the NLT. It says it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. So nothing else matters. We have everything that we need in God. Everything now is temporary. Everything in God is permanent. As we go to God this morning to share in communion. Jesus here tells us that we have all that we need in him. Because as he sat with his disciples having that final Passover meal and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. He's telling us that in his in him, he went to the cross and had his arms and hands and feet nailed to the cross for us to take away our sin. And when he took the cup later in the mill and he filled it, and he said, this is my blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. He's telling us that he shed his blood so that we could be righteous with the Father. That we could spend eternity 
with God. Mark says this all the time. Life ends. Eternity where? This is our reminder of where. And we get to go be with the Father in heaven. If you've got your cups, go ahead and open them up. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we thank you for this reminder each and every time that we come together that you make us righteous through your gift, our undeserved gift of mercy through your son's sacrifice for us. Whatever fears we have out there, Father, whatever is, is causing us to have some anxiety or whatever that is that is getting in the way, Father, we ask that you would show yourself to us in those deep, dark moments. And that like David and our call to worship, that we would go immediately to you. Not, no fluff, nothing else. We just tell you what we need. Because that's what you want to hear. You want us to acknowledge you and that you are our great physician, our ultimate healer. You can take care of all of it. The scriptures tell us that in this life we will have troubles. But Jesus says, fear not, for I have overcome the world. Thank you for that hope over fear, Father. In Jesus' name. We come to our time in the service today for our prayers, concerns, and our victories, as I like to call them. And uh, we've got some people here who are going through some uh, medical procedures, one that came through a medical procedure very well this week, and uh, I'd help you to report, so uh, thank you for the kind prayers and everything. Um, we have some people that can't be with us this morning because they are having some medical issues, and so we lift them up in prayer today as well. If anyone has any others they'd like to share this morning, please feel free. And uh, if not, uh, please feel free to share with us online. Uh, Pastor Mark or Pastor Terry at gracestreet.church. Uh, send us your prayer requests. We'll make sure that we get those included in our weekly prayer sessions as well and in our daily prayers. So let's go to God right now and uh, thank him for this day. Gracious Lord, we thank you for all of the blessings you give us each and every day, for the privilege and the right to lift up people who are struggling, who are, who are grieving, who, Lord, are, are lost in their ways, and that we have the opportunity to pray for them, to bring them to you, to lift them up to you, and to name them and claim them and claim these things as victories in Jesus' name. Victory over sickness, victory over mourning, victory over grief, victory over being lost in the world. So thank you, Father God, for giving us those promises that we can stand on and stand with each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name. So this comes to our closing time of our online portion of our service today. And I uh, thank everyone for being here and for either being here in person or being with us online. And we look forward to being able to share the word of God with you even further as we go on. For those of you who are sitting here, we get some really cool music to uh, jump up and, and sing to today. And I hope you enjoy that as well. So let's go to God for our closing prayer today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you make all things new. We thank you for the victory and power in your name. And thank you that you hold the keys over death. And that by your might, 
Jesus was raised from the grave, paving that way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had that plan and that you made that way for us. We confess our need for you today to refresh us and make us new again. We ask for your redemption for us. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us and keep us focused on what is pure and right. Give us the power to be obedient to your word. Embolden us to bring that word to others. And when the enemy reminds us where we have been, sending his lies and attacks our way, we need to trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense, our guard, keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls Lord, lead us on your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, and over us to be a light to our world. May we make a difference in this world for your glory and your purposes. Set your way before us. Make all your plans succeed. That we might reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence your healing. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift of love. And to you be the glory and honor on this day and every day forever. In Jesus' name.